trying to accomplish. So this morning, I think we're going to talk a little bit about board basics, and then this afternoon, we'll talk a little bit about some of the nuances that uh, are involved in boards as they get more mature. Um, so I'll try to run through some material pretty quickly, and then I want it to be more of an interactive session. So if you have questions, just feel free to interrupt, and I'd love, I'd love to respond to more what you want to hear than, than just what I want to say. Um, so having said that, the, the role of governance, I mean, it sounds like a big topic, uh, is it really about, you know, somebody proselytizing from the mountaintop and telling people what to do on a daily basis, or is it a little bit more complex than that? Um, so I thought we'd start with a little talk to this here. I know that may, many of you may not have seen this in the syllabus, but this is a multiple choice, so it should be pretty easy. Um, which of these definitions seems to fit what we think of as governance in the nonprofit space. Um, both are oh, well. probably correct, <laughs> but our opinion is that this one is actually more critical. Um, we've all been through the motions of setting up a board and you have to have the legal structure and all of that, but, but that's the bare minimum. And I think there's a lot more that boards can do and should do in the nonprofit setting, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So what exactly is governance? Um, Complex topic, lots of different components, can be very confusing. Every organization is under-resourced, trying to do a hundred different things. Um, and the board stuff is maybe 5% of, of what everybody worries about. Um, so we'll try to put a little more order in that today. For the purpose of today's discussion, we're really talking about governance as, as the board of directors, directors and how that can be more highly functional in the organization. <coughs> So why do you spend time on this, given all of the incredible mission work that you're trying to do, the programs you're trying to put on, the fundraising that's critical to success? Why is governance important? Is it just oversight? Is it really just to make sure that everyone's doing their job and that all of the I's and dot are dotted and T's are crossed? We think it's actually, actually more, much more than that. It's not just oversight. Uh, it has to do with strategy. The board is really the primary place that longer term vision for the future and strategic decisions get made, previewed, um, iterated as time goes on. So it's, it's more of a strategic question than just a governance question. Change management. We live in a very complex world, especially in the nonprofit space. Challenges in funding, um, increasing demand for services, uh, competition for eyeballs, for dollars, for board members, for staff, uh, even for facilities. Uh, and so that change really needs to start at the top. How do you really deliver on the mission? For nonprofits, um, we have what we call mission creep. And so how do you make sure that the organization itself is focused on the most important things going on within the organization? Uh, and they're just more than a rubber stamp there. And then how do you represent the organization? Uh, most boards are internally focused for very good reasons. But we think really high-functioning boards are externally focused and can leverage their networks, are really spokespeople in the community, attend events like this, and carry that message about the important work that's being done beyond just the friends and family and insiders on the board. And then finally, uh, sharing performance. Really, uh, there's long-term board members, there are long-term staff members. That's both a good thing and potentially a challenge as we make sure that the organization stays current and people are accountable and there's transparency within the organization for what's happening. So those are some of the reasons that governance is important and we'll talk more about this today. So boards come in different flavors and sizes. Um, everything from a small board uh, meeting around a table to a big board meeting at you know, an impressive conference room like I'm sure the State Farm probably has in the headquarters one day. Um, we call these working boards and governing boards, but even within those two, there's some dis different distinctions in a working board. You might have a startup board, you may have a, a board that's more hands-on as the organization matures. The governing board can evolve into, later on, a fundraising board or an externally facing board. But those are the two uh, types of boards we see most often. These are some of the characteristics, early stage and later stage. You may be able to identify where your board is at this particular juncture in your organization's history. Um, but usually boards have components of both of these. Um, but it's a transition. I think smaller organizations, startups, have more of a working board. And then some of those responsibilities are shifted onto staff as time goes on. 
and then as organizations get more mature, the board doesn't have to be as hands-on and micromanage the color of the staff meeting agenda paper, and they can focus on more important things uh, uh, for the organization as a well. whole. So going from a working board to a governing board doesn't happen overnight. It's a process uh, that needs to be carefully managed, both from the board level, potentially the staff level, and funders and outsiders also can start this transition. <coughs> Most boards, as I mentioned, go through that transition to something of a hybrid uh, and stay in that mode perhaps for a long period of time. But a vision of where the board has been and where the board wants to be over time is very important. So static boards aren't, aren't helpful as the organization changes and grows. The board actually needs to grow and change along with the organization. So the role of governance, um, generally, you have to start somewhere. So, you know, uh, people, we like to meet organizations as a consultant where they are. It's not helpful for us to come in and prescribe a big uh, set of uh, fixes for a board that may not be ready for that yet. So we like to start with some fundamental questions about the role of the board as a way of level setting um, both board members and staff members and figuring out what needs to happen next. So I'm going to run through those pretty quickly and then we can talk more about them. Question one. Sorry, I'm sorry. I assume yes. we'll get will we get copies of the slides or can we? Yes, I can give you those. Sure. Thanks. I know there's a lot here and uh, don't don't try to take notes and we'll give you this stuff later. Uh, I think there may be video we said there can be videotape. Yep. Right there. Great. So um, first of all, it's important to think about the question about what exactly the duties of the board are and should be. Uh, oftentimes this skip this step is skipped. And people assume that boards know what they're doing, that everybody knows which lane they should be in. Um, and that's not always the case. So sometimes it's good to go back and say, why are we really here? So is it just a social club? Is it a, a group of like-minded individuals who get together because they care about a, different, a, a particular issue? Or is there something more than that? Is it really the sum of the parts is greater than any individual contributor could do by themselves? And I think, I think that that's true. But again, it's a process to get there. So it starts really with what are the individual and collective responsibilities of the board. Uh, and you have a sample in your packet of uh, board uh, job description. And there are also special directors or advisory board members. So there might be distinctions among the different board members as to what their particular jobs are and they can try it. And then, just like you do with your employees, it's, it needs to have some sort of performance review. How many people do performance reviews on the employee level on an annual basis? Raise your hands. Okay. How many people do that same process for board members? Far fewer. So, not only, most, most organizations have a job description. There's a, uh, a survey in your packet. I think it's 80% of organizations have a board job description. But I would, most organizations do not do a performance review. It's not so that you can remove people, but it's so that you can set clear expectations and standards about what the role of the board is. And I think people want to know that when they come into a board, they want to know that while they're in the board, and that can also give them a signal as to when it might be time to leave the board. So committee structure. So boards meet on a regular basis, monthly, quarterly, hopefully no less frequently than that. But the real work of boards gets done in committees. Um, and committees often get overlooked. Uh, the, the board as a whole is often very unwieldy. Some people specialize in one area of the board, board work or other, and that happens best in this committee structure. So what happens in these committee meetings? And how are they structured? So the committees, I think we have some more to say on this later in the deck, but there's a way to structure committee work that makes it productive and can, and can allow the board to function at a much higher level and allow people to specialize. And the last question is, how do you figure uh, diversity into this equation? And what is the right appropriate size for boards? Over time, boards have become smaller and smaller. We've worked with organizations that have 32 board members. I was just at a board staff retreat for an organization in California, there were 62 people at that retreat. Um, but really, the trend is to get much, much smaller. Uh, Teach for America in San Francisco employs 400 teachers, one of the largest affiliates of Teach for America. They have a board of four people. 
Um, so the trend over time is to get smaller, but it's really the appropriate size for the work that you're trying to do in the community you're trying to serve. And then diversity, we're going to talk more about that. It's more than just demographic or socioeconomic diversity. It's more than just reflecting the types of constituents that you serve. It can be <coughs> skills-based, knowledge-based, experience-based as well. So we're going to talk about a little more complex view of diversity. But why is that important? You don't want people, exactly the same type of people who care about the mission and who all have the same background and get together and pat each other on the back and say, yes, we're doing a good job. The board is really designed to represent a diverse set of views so that uh, they can, you can challenge one another, challenge the staff, and connect with people who are outside the friends and family of the organization. And everybody doing the same thing and trying to contribute in the same area is not a recipe for success. Okay, so the um, idea of here we have all of these different stakeholders. How do they all get along? This gives you a sense of the complexity. I'm sure in your organizations you, you can relate to this. Uh, we like this concept of racy, which some people are responsible, some people are accountable, some people need to be consulted during the process, and some people just need to be informed. And so the board role is not to make every decision at the organization, nor is the staff role to make every decision. So, and then you have advisory board members, funders, outside help, uh, et cetera. So how do you coordinate all of that? It can be very, very complex, and it's worth thinking through on the front side. So here are some of the uh, decision-making uh, areas. You, we don't have to go through all of these, but many of your organizations go through very common you know, points. Uh, and how do you, you divide up who does what amongst all those different bodies? So how do we answer some of these questions? So for board duties, first of all, here are the basic duties of every board. These you can find any, uh, anywhere. Uh, the mission, purpose, the, uh, vision for the organization, uh, strategic direction, how do they evaluate and hire the executive director. You notice that this doesn't say that the boards hire the development director or the receptionist or the program director. So the board really is designed to manage the executive director, and that's really the executive director that manages the rest of the staff. Sounds very straightforward, but I can tell you from a lot of my experience that that's not always the case in terms of boards. Uh, review and approve the annual budget. That doesn't mean that they uh, come up with the annual budget, but their fiduciary job is to do that. Uh, externally facing, um, self-assessment, and finally this ensure that the, the organization has the proper resources um, to perform its mission. And that tends to have a very heavy fundraising component, although not always. So we work with Goodwill in San Francisco, $40 million, 1,000 employee organization that's been around for uh, 100 years. And 95% of their income is earned through the 22 stores that they operate. So the board spends a lot of time worrying about how to run an efficient retail business that <coughs> employs goodwill uh, graduates and spends very little of their time worrying about fundraising. Mm -hmm. So earned revenue is actually increasingly becoming an important part of what nonprofits do. And that, that particular mix of revenue implies very different composition of the board than you would think for an organization that large. So those basic duties, here's a draft description of the board's role uh, in an organization, which again seems fairly self-explanatory, but before you can get to the individual job descriptions, you need to figure out what it is that the board itself is trying to do, separately from what the organization is trying to do. And this is just a draft, you can change this, but it might be worth thinking about that or assigning somebody that or thinking about that at a board and staff retreat. What's the board's particular role in the organization? We know what the staff does, we know what the programs are. Why is the board here? Is it fundraising? Is it governance? Is it some combination of those duties I listed on the, on the previous page? So in terms of individual board member responsibilities, I don't know if you can read this here. It says, Lucy says, uh, I've always wondered why you decided to be a dog, and Snoopy says, I was fooled by the job description. Um, I have a beagle, so I try to include each of, each of my presentations some reference to beagles, and I got my beagle through a uh, uh, rescue. Beagle Rescue, Northern California Beagle Rescue. Yeah. Uh, we only have one. Uh, it's, my second, it's my second beagle. My wife is lobbying hard for a puppy, but uh, the dog, the dog, the dog uh, spent the first five years of its life in a, in a cage, so the, 
great dog personality wise, but things like grass and stairs and leash and treats and toys were all brand new to that dog, as was going to the bathroom outside. <laughs> so it's been a good combination of puppies in there. But in any, way, in any event, um, the job description is really important, especially when you're recruiting new board members. People want to know what they're getting into and it needs to be a little bit more nuanced. So again, individual director and then maybe <coughs> for some special needs to satisfy some of your diversity criteria, possibly, uh, not just in terms of demographics again, but we need an attorney, we need somebody who's familiar with the retail environment at Goodwill, we need somebody who knows about real estate we're trying to build a building. Uh, what are those individual job descriptions? And this gives you some view of how we think about this in a more complex way. We'll send this to you, I don't want to spend a lot of time going over it, but um, you can see some of the individual things we think about there, including the performance management piece, which is very important, linked to the job description, just like it is with your employees. So here's some typical responsibilities of a board of an individual board member and set of expectations that are good to lay out on the front side. Um, most of these are pretty self-explanatory, but again, I think it helps to be very intentional about them. And then for people who hold various offices, and we'll talk more about this at our board president roundtable, um, those differ, obviously, um, amongst us. You may have different skill sets, and sometimes the same person is not good at all of those roles. So how do you structure these committees um, in each of your individual boards? There are some committees that are mandated by law, um, in California, the finance and audit committees now have to be separate, which kind of makes sense when you think about somebody putting together a budget, managing the budget, and maybe somebody else overseeing whether or not that budget is actually uh, happening. Um, those are what we call standing committees of the board, very self-explanatory. There's some different things that those committees do, which I'm sure you all know. Uh, but increasingly, boards are functioning in an ad hoc way. And so they are getting people together for a finite period of time who are really excited or have been tasked with a particular aspect of the organization. And they're working for a finite period of time very intensely, and then they're going to reshuffle and go do something else as that thing. So when we think about that as doing a strategic plan. In our experience, we do a lot of strategic planning work. We do a lot of search work. Um, and we do a lot of fundraising work. So we do human capital. The way that we think about that is organizational capacity here, strategic planning, financial capacity here, and then human human capital and capacity in the search business. So boards get together, and using the Goodwill example again, we've been working there for over a year in various aspects of those with different parts of the board. So not every board member gets excited about fundraising. So let those people get together to do an event or to do a particular end of the year campaign, and then let's disband and, and reshuffle Etc. So I just want to introduce that idea of these ad hoc committees or task forces or however you want to refer to them as an alternative to the standing committees uh, on the board. So let's talk a little bit about diversity and size. Um, you know, is it a, a melting pot or a stew or a salad or it's just one of the images we've used? Um, size and diversity, both. This is an example of a diversity matrix that we've done for one of our clients. I know it's a little hard to read here, but it gives, us, gives you an idea of how we think about diversity. These are demographic, industry, background, functional skills, and seniority. Um, and they're criteria within, within each one of those. Not a huge board, probably 20 people, but it's for a membership association that represents half of the $1.2 trillion textile and apparel industry worldwide. And so they're very interested in where their board members come from, geographically, what they bring to the table, where they are at their different organizations. So we're very intentional about laying this out and then scoring the current board against this criteria. And the reason that that's important is that um, <coughs> then you can determine where you are and where you need to be. And you can recruit the board members that can fill or double down on some of those diversity criteria that you've established. So again, it seems fairly self-explanatory to say, we want a diverse board, but what does that really mean? And it might be worth thinking that through in terms of the skill sets and attributes that you want in a board. Uh, and then we can't get there overnight, and so thinking about your ideal candidate, just like you would do with a, a new employee, an executive director, a development director, 
and thinking about what that person is today, what that person might be a year from now or five years from now, and you need to make progress on that over time. So you may not be able to fill all of the diversity re requirements on day one, but it's worth thinking about that in a multi-year sort of task and filling those gaps is what the recruiting process is. Okay, this is going really fast. Um, I don't know what C level means. So that's so the CEO um, getting people uh, from organizations that might be at the CEO level or the COO level or CFO, so Chief Executive Officer, Chief Operating Officer, Chief Financial Officer. That might be a goal that it was for this last organization. I just that they currently have people who are more at the manager level or director level, and what they want to do over the next few years is get people who really are decision makers at all these big apparel. Uh, organizations like the Nikes, the Adidas, and et cetera, and Walmarts over time. So very ambitious, but they've put a stake in the ground and said that's what they want. Um, and it may take them several years to get there. Okay, uh, here's some of the things we're going to talk about later or other things that we do as a firm um, that are more advanced once you have these basics down. How does the board make decisions? Uh, especially needs to be the staff. We'll talk some more about that this afternoon. Um, how do you do the selection and recruiting process intentionally? Does it just, uh, you know, Bob has a friend he works with who wants to join a board, and Bob brings the friend to a couple meetings, and before you know it, that friend's on the, on the board, or is it more intentional than that? Uh, we think about these as an organization, core values, which is what we believe, professional practices, how we work together, and key factors for success, which is what everybody does uh, to make the organization work. Uh, we think about those for employees a lot. We've done a lot of work in board development where we think about those for board members as well. Uh, so it might be worth thinking about that as a subject for retreat. And then finally, how are we assessing performance relative to that criteria that we've established? You have on there, how should board members behave with each other? Yeah. What, what's your... Where are you going with that? Yeah, so I mean, we see boards across the spectrum. We see highly functioning boards, we see functioning boards, and we see boards that have dysfunction. <laughs> and so uh, we like to work with highly functioning boards, but that isn't always the case. So things like transparency and decision making, um, that racy, who needs to be consulted, who needs to be informed, uh, who needs to make be on decisions, the difference between what the executive committee of the board might do versus what the other committees of the board might do versus what the full board might do, how the board interacts with staff. Uh, is it one person on the board or is it all the board? Is there just with the executive director or are there other channels for communication with the staff? So those are the sorts of questions. Um, we've got how, even how often the board meets, you know, whether, how often, how much in advance do agendas get distributed? Who comes up with those agendas? I mean, there's some there's some you know, basics that I think can change the direction of the board radically over time. How the board spends their time when they meet is: Do you spend you know 90% of the meeting hearing reports from staff and rubber stamping those, or is all of that combined into a consent agenda that the first five minutes of the meeting are spent on, and then you spend time talking about the mission? They're different. There's the Carver model. If anybody wants to write that down and research it, there's a way of thinking about how boards function, maybe more for a mature board than for a startup and a working board. But all of those things are, people are really changing and, and looking hard at how boards work. And I think that prevents a lot of burnout. So people come to board meetings and they say, well, gosh, you know, we're talking about the same thing for a year. Um, maybe I should spend my time elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So how they have people interact together is very, very important. Just like staff or any other relationship that you're in for that matter. Yes? What are your thoughts around the formal documentation on the board? I mean, bylaws, using Rob or Robert's rules of order, maybe having some manuals or handbooks or standard procedures or <coughs> code of ethics of how you expect members to interact with each other? Yeah, I think that sort of infrastructure is, is very important. Um, different boards might need different types of things. I mean, it might be more of a consensus-driven board than a Robert's Rules of Order board. Certainly bylaws are important and should be revisited periodically. There are free uh, legal services. You know, at Stanford, where we're, near where we are, there's a, the Stanford Law Clinic has students who do pro bono work helping 
organizations bring their bylaws from the 19th century into the 21st century, um, which I know is a very fascinating topic for some people, but maybe not for everybody. Um, so some of those things I think are important, um, uh, but you know I wouldn't over-generate that unless there's a problem, a particular problem you're trying to solve. I guess would be my advice. It's much better to spend time on the mission of the program than is creating infrastructure just for infrastructure's sake. All right. Um, here are some resources. We'll, you know, we'll send you these. I think some of the board source stuff is in your packet. Um, there's many, many more. Compass Point has a great report called Underdeveloped, which talks about fundraising and why boards, executive directors, and chief development officers have a short lifespan and how they're, why they're not being successful, uh, successful as they might want to be. It's based on national survey. Um, Anyway, uh, those are some of the resources, and if I could look, spend a few minutes talking about questions before we revisit the fruit and the bagels and the coffee outside, um, and we can spend more time talking about this throughout the day, but uh, let me know what things you're experiencing uh, at the board, and we can talk, and there's a lot of knowledge in the room, too, there's a your peer group, about what works and what doesn't work. Would you describe what a consensus, what you consider a consensus? Board as opposed to uh, Robert's Rules Board? Yeah, so consensus, we, we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, there's a difference between alignment and consensus and then decision making. So, alignment is everybody pointed in the same direction. Consensus means collective decision making, uh, agreement on how we're going to get to that magical place that we've all aligned around. And then decision making is who needs to make those decisions in the interim. So, they're different models. Um, some things require a formal vote. I would, you know, think um, hiring a new executive director, approving a budget, some of those things might need a Robert's Rules of Order, make a motion, make a second, have discussion, yays, nays, and extensions. Other things might be without objection. So the consent agenda, approval of the previous meetings, minutes, um, that kind of thing. Uh, so I think different circumstances might call for different things. Uh, tend not to want to vote too often because that creates people who are on one side and the other. Um, but in some, in some cases, that's appropriate. Whether to embark on a capital campaign, you know, whether to buy a new building, I mean, some of those things need a formal vote. But usually, enough work has been done that the formal vote is uh, not a surprise. Right? That's the best part. Where we've already done the consensus work on the front side. Yes? Is there kind of an average age of an organization for that hybrid mode? Um, I don't found? think it's so much age. Um, it could be. But let me, let me just ask, how many people here have annual budgets less than $500,000? <laughs> okay. How many people have budgets uh, between $500,000 and $1 million? And how many people have budgets between $1 and $5 million? And over five million dollars. So, I think you know, in our experience, and this is just based on a lot of different work. It's not a hard and fast rule, but less than a million dollars, more of a working board. Once you get to that million dollar, ten staff member, maybe you've been in business for five years or more, place more time for a governing board. Greater than five million dollars, more of a fundraising board, an outward facing board. So I don't, I don't want to say that those are hard and fast rules, but, but generally that's sort of the case. We have organizations that are brand new, like this uh, uh, membership organization I was talking about uh, for the apparel industry. They're only three years old, but they're quickly going through the transition from the working board to the governing board and now are a fundraising board very, very quickly in three years' time. But they're growing at you know, 40, 50 percent a year. Uh, other organizations have been around for, you know, like Goodwill for 100 years. And, don't do any fundraising. So. I guess my concern is, you know, our board changes every three years, or possibly every six years. Mm -hmm. And if a working board gets in there, more operationally type working board, then the whole kind of focus seems to change, or the work patterns, or so I don't, I guess, how much do you let your staff Versus your board. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question to think about staff versus board, and again, we'll talk more about that this afternoon. Okay. It doesn't necessarily have to mean new people on the board. Mm -hmm. You can make that transition sometimes with the same people, but sometimes it does mean new people. That 
and different people, for those of you who are new board members or looking to join boards, I mean, where, do you want to join a fully mature governing board, or do you really like that roll up your sleeves, start up, hands-on type of experience? Those are, those are two different questions, and some people get excited about one, and when they make the transition to the other one, they go and find a new organization who they could do that with. So some of that is a good thing. Yes, ma'am. So you kind of touched on, on the idea of maybe term limits. You have term limits on your board? Yeah. Um, any rules about uh, Yeah, we, we think term limits are a good thing. Uh, we think uh, whether they're <coughs> formal and institutionalized in the bylaws or whether they're informal, <laughs> but we think rotation and, and turnover is actually good. Talk more about that this afternoon, um, and that's become an increasing trend: is to adopt formal term limits for boards. And there are a lot of reasons to do that. I think it helps give people a time horizon, assess performance, move people off who, you know, are not participating as much as they used to, um, and gives people, you know, it, and you can renew those terms. I mean, it's not that people have to disappear, but there's a point at which the decision needs to be made one way or the other, both by the individual and by the organization, which I think is very helpful. So, short answer, but I'll talk more about it. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? No? Then I don't want to keep your finger. Yeah. The fruit. Well, yeah.